Repeat after me. Say, this is the word of God. What it says is true. I love that, that energy, Sister Pat. Uh, if I follow the word of God, I cannot lose. I can't go wrong. I can't be defeated. Say, I am victorious. Look at somebody. Say, we are victorious. Say, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Hey, Amen. Now open that Bible up to Genesis. Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21. We were in chapter 22 last week, but we're going to take a step back and we're going to look at chapter 21. Somebody say, we need context. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're going to take a look a little further into this. We're going to start at verse 8, and I'm going to summarize what's happened up to this point. The son that God has promised Abraham and Sarah has now been born. God made a promise to Abraham. He was 75 years old. And he told him that he would have many descendants. He would make a great nation out of him. Now, as you know, in order to be made a nation, you got to have a child. Yeah. Somebody say you need babies to make a nation. Yeah. Well, ultimately, it wasn't until Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac, the son of promise, was born to him. And so now we're coming on the other side of his birth. And I want you to see what takes place after this. Verse 8. So Genesis chapter 21, verse 8. And it says, so the child grew and was weaned. That means that he was taken off of the bottle. Y'all understand that? And Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar. Now, that's the Egyptian that was her handmaiden that she gave to uh, Abraham to have a baby through. Because they said that God was taking too long. Yeah. So she saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. We'll talk about that in a moment. Therefore, she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. Get him out of here. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing. It was stressful. It was distressing to Abram, Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice for in Isaac, you shall oh, excuse me for in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Yet I will make a nation out of the son of the bondwoman because she is your seed. Let's look a little bit further. So Abraham woke, rose early in the morning and he took bread and a skin of water and putting it on her shoulder, that's Hagar, he gave it, he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Amen. Remain standing. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I pray that, Lord, that as we dig a little further into your scripture, that, Father, somebody would hear what your spirit is saying to the church. Father, we love you, Lord. And, Father, we won't be fed if, if you don't feed us, God. So, Father, I stand here as a shepherd, but, Father, you are the provider. Hallelujah. Father, provide for your people today a meal that would fill us, Lord. I pray that, Lord, through this word, that somebody would be healed, somebody would be set free, that somebody would be delivered. Father, I believe that just one word, Father, you can speak 
will touch every circumstance and every situation. Get the glory in, out, and through my life. In Jesus' name, and everybody say amen. As you take your seat, look at your neighbor and tell them the title of today's message. Say the alternative. The alternative. Yeah. We're in a series right now titled The Altar Call. Uh, how many of you saw the message from last week, whether it be online or in person? How many of you saw the message? Wave your hand. Wave your hand if you did. All right. Praise the Lord. Um, I'll give you a quick recap. The altar call is traditionally the part of the service where right after the pastor or the preacher finishes speaking, um, they say that we open up the doors of the church. I want you to know that the doors of the church are always open. But essentially what we're saying in that moment is we welcome anyone to come and give their lives to Jesus. That's number one. You can also be baptized, number two, which kind of goes with number one. But then you can also, as they would say, come by letter. That means that you're coming from another ministry and you have the, uh, the, uh, the approval or the recommendation from your previous church. Or you can come under Christian experience, meaning that you're a believer, but now you want to be a part of this particular congregation. Does that make sense, y'all? Yeah. Normally, people would see this as the finish line. But we've identified, and I firmly believe that it's not the finish line, but Brother Cheatham, it's the starting blocks. It's the moment from which our, our life in Jesus Christ begins. Somebody say, it's the starting blocks. Yeah, this is the starting point. You're not finished. Yeah, this is not a moment for you to find you a pew and put your name on it and then tell somebody to get up when they're sitting in your spot. That, that's not what that's about. It's not about waiting till the certain part of the song uh, that you know gets you excited and that's when you want to stand up and start clapping and singing. No, that's not, that's not the point. The point is not for you to get in a choir or become an usher or, or just a deacon or whatever it may be. No, no, no. Somebody say there's more. Yeah, this is the point where you have actually been invited into what we call a sacrificial lifestyle. Look at the words. Just look at the words taken for face value. Altar call. Y'all say it with me. Altar call. The altar is a place of worship. It's a place of sacrifice. And it's a place of faith. You cannot go to the altar if you don't have a sacrifice. And you surely aren't worshiping if you don't have a sacrifice. And ultimately, in order to present any of those, you've got to have faith. Somebody say, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Yeah. And so that's what the altar represents. But now we look a little further at the word call. The word call means invitation. It's an invitation. Yeah, if you don't want somebody to show up at your party, what do you do? You don't call them. But I want you to know that God has called everybody to come and join him in this lifestyle, in this faith that, that believes in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He's invited everyone into the kingdom. He has. But understand that many are called, but few are chosen ultimately because they're not willing to present their lives as a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is actually our basic and proper worship we can't worship God as apostle Paul said if we're not willing to give him everything yeah, that's why when we were praying over our offering that we said to the Lord, we're not just giving you this money, but Father, we give you our lives because ultimately that's what God desires. When Jesus made it clear about the gift, he said that he said that um, wherever a man's treasure is, his heart is also. So ultimately, the gift is a representation of my heart. But it seems to me that uh, many of us have gotten real common with giving the, the, the dollar, but we have no, no, no desire or intention to give our lives. Somebody said you got to do both. 
you've got to be willing to give God your entire life as a living sacrifice. So ultimately, that's what the requirement is. We saw last week where Abraham was called to the region of Moriah, to this mountain, to offer his son, his promised son, the one that we just read about that was born, that he waited 25 years for, or you could say 100 years for. And here it is. God is saying, I want you to offer it. Wait a second, God. Wait. You promised me this thing. But we ultimately saw that if you withhold nothing from God, hallelujah. Oh, God, I thank you. If you withhold nothing from God, somebody say nothing. Yeah. If you withhold nothing from God, ultimately God will bless you beyond measure. God will bless you in ways that you could have never imagined, Deaconess Diggs. You, could even, you couldn't even think about. It, it, it exceedingly and abundantly is how Paul described this thing. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ever ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. But the power that we possess is that we must be willing to offer the sacrifice but we find that many people want nothing to do with the altar sister Cheatham sister Chandra the altar is going to cost me and so instead of going to the altar what we do um sister Mary as we go and we find alternatives we look for other ways we look for other options you know how we say I'm going to explore my options because we're looking for the best deal yeah uh, my mother-in-law she was talking about her car buying process mother by way of love amen um, she was describing her car buying process and she said that when they went the first time she said that the dealer uh, called off a number that was way too high her and her husband said nope that's all right and they went on somewhere else and they found something that was a much better deal for them. Now, that's appropriate when it comes to buying a car or perhaps buying a house. I don't know about this market, but ultimately what you may do is you have the options to look around. Even when it comes to you and you looking for a spouse, you keep your options open. You'd be like, yeah, I hear you, but... I'm going to wait a second. We're going to wait this thing out before I put a ring on it or before I receive a ring from you. Y'all feel what I'm saying here? Yeah, yeah. We, we, we have this tendency to keep our options open. We want to explore our options. We want to explore what are the options that I have. But I want you to know that when it comes to God, there is no other option. When it comes to our creator, there is no other option. There's nobody else that I can go to. It's only him. He is the alpha and the omega. Everything starts with him. Everything ends with him. Nothing would exist if it wasn't by way of him. Understand that God is the only way. He's the only way. Somebody say there's no other option. But yet, we find so many alternatives. We find in our text that Abraham, he had been promised by God at the age of 75 that God was going to bless him and make him a nation. He said, leave from your father's house. Leave from that land and the place that you have become so familiar with. And I'm going to, and I want you to go to a place where I will show you. In other words, you have never seen this thing before. And Abraham had to make the decision to decide, am I going to trust God? Am I going to leave what makes me feel comfortable and go into a place that I've never experienced before? And he went. I would argue that, that Abraham at the, in, at the mountain in the, in the region of Moriah, that wasn't his first time at the altar. That Abraham spent his life at the altar. He sacrificed everything to go and see something he's never seen before. Are you willing to live your life at the altar? He said, I'm not going to 
I'm not going to stay where I'm comfortable. I may not understand it, but I'm going anyhow. I may not know where I'm going, but I'm going anyhow. Because if God told me as the praise team or worship team said it earlier, that settles it. If God said it, that settles it. Whether or not you believe it, that settles it. Whether or not you got other ideas, that settles it. There is no plan that is better than the plan of God. Hallelujah. Somebody say, God, I thank you for your plan. Abraham, he kept going. He made his way out to the land of Canaan. But now here he is in this place and God has blessed him abundantly. His, his investments have brought back so much return. Here he is, a, a, a very wealthy man, but he's thinking to himself, the only person that I can give this to are my servants because I am still without a child. God told him, he said, I'm going to give you a son. He said, God, really? Don't you think we're beyond this time? I think we missed that boat a long time ago. <laughs> for real? Perhaps for somebody you're thinking and saying, I missed my opportunity. I missed the chance to start that business. I missed the opportunity on love. I've missed the opportunity on a success that I imagine. I don't have time to dream anymore. God is saying, if you would trust him, somebody say he'll redeem the time. Oh, yeah, he will. He's the one that controls time. <laughs> when they prayed out to him in the middle of the battle, he said, Lord, hold the sun. Hallelujah. And the sun, the sun stood still until they finished the battle. Somebody say, God will redeem the time for you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so here we find Abraham said, okay, well, Lord, I'll, I'll trust you. That's what you promised me, Lord. I'll trust you. So they waited. They waited a good while. Now here we come. If I'm correct, Abraham is 86 years old. Still ain't nothing. Sarah said, well, maybe the Lord changed his mind. Maybe he, he really don't want to bless us. Maybe we ought to do something different. You know. We are creative as people. We're innovative. That's good because uh, that comes as one of our traits that come from God. He's a creator. We were made in his image according to his likeness, so you should have the ability to think critically. But sometimes in our critical thinking, we could become willfully stupid. As Solomon, the wisest man in the world, Yet it seemed like he was yet so foolish. Outsmarted his own self. Here comes Abraham and Sarah. They say, well, Sarah said, why don't you take Hagar, my handmaid? Abraham, he didn't reject it. That became his second wife. She was a bond servant, but he made her his wife. Well, look at what happened here. Now we find that she has a son by the name of Ishmael. Ishmael, well, and I would even say before she had the baby, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but during the pregnancy, after Hagar realized that she had conceived a baby, the very thing that they thought was their way or their route to the blessing, it came right back and bit them in the behind. Yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, Hagar, she's walking around the house, and she's looking at Sarah. I got a baby. What you got? Ain't nothing coming up out of that child. I'm, I'm adding to it, y'all. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to make it plain for us. Is that all right, y'all? I'm making it plain. Yeah. Sarah got hot with her. And she said, she said, you want to come for me, baby? I'm coming for you. 
And she clapped back so hard, Shane Greer, that the heifer ran out the house. <laughs> I don't want to call her a heifer, y'all. Lord forgive me for calling her a heifer. But that's how she was acting. <laughs> she left. She ran. The Spirit of God had to tell Hagar to go back and, and submit herself to, to her, her maid, her maiden. And so they go on. The little boy, he grows up now at the age of 13. And here it is. Abraham is 99. And God has, um, he's gone on and even now he's bearing the mark of the covenant. That was um, circumcision. He became circumcised. We'll talk about that another Sunday. But now he's prepared for the promise. At 100 years old, at 99, Sarah got pregnant when Abraham was 99. She was about 89, 90, somewhere up in there. At 100 years old, she finally has the son. She finally has the son. But somebody say there's trouble on the home front. I sound real old school. Let's go a little further here. Verse 9, we're in Genesis chapter 21 now. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, that's Ishmael she's talking about, the Egyptian of whom she had born to Abraham. She saw him scoffing. She saw him scoffing. Um, you, could, you could define that as laughing. And immediately, you know what Sarah was thinking about. She was thinking about his mama. She was thinking about how his mama was being nasty to her when she was pregnant. Be mindful that whatever is in you will make itself known inside of your children. Y'all got to hear me, parents. Kids, hear me as well. The same issues you give your mama today. Oh, boy, I tell you. The Bible said, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you are also going to reap. Somebody, I just helped you so much. You say, now I understand. Jesus, I understand what I'm reaping now because I put my mama through, through the worst of the worst. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah sweetie. That's why I look at you and I know exactly what's going on with you because you came from me. Yeah. She's like, listen here, before it even got any further, before it, could, before it could become something, she said to Abraham, she said, get him out of here. Him and his mama. If she was in this time, she would have said, him and his mammy. Get him out of here. Yeah. Yeah. Abraham, it bothered him. The Bible says that Abraham became displeased. The word displeased means distressed. Abraham was stressed out because for 13, 14 years, he's been raising this young man. He's been growing him up. He's been teaching him with an expectation that somehow, some way, this young man would be connected to my legacy. But now that the son that God promised him has arrived, his wife Sarah is saying, there is no way that the alternative, that where we messed up, that that's going to have a, a part of the inheritance. Now, here it is. She was the one that initiated this. But now here she is, the one firmly coming and saying, he's not going to be a part of what God blessed us with. Because he was never meant to be a part of the blessing. Now Abraham is stressed out because he's like, Lord, I can't just kick them out. It's my fault they're here. I know that she made the recommendation, but I'm the one that ultimately submitted to it. And here... I've got to make the decision to part.
part ways with the very thing that I've invested so much of my life into. And the Lord spoke up to him. And he said to Abraham, don't let this thing stress you out. Don't let it bother or be even bothered by what you see because of the boy and because of your bondwoman. He said, whatever Sarah, thank you, Lord, whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. Husbands, let me help you out today. Young men, when you get married one day, this is the best piece of advice I can give you. There are some times where you need to listen to what your wife said. Let me help you. We could, we could get rid of a lot of arguments and avoid a lot of issues. Yeah, some of y'all wives say, my husband ain't here, but I'm going to play it for him when he get back to the house. <laughs> you can avoid a lot of stuff if you would listen. Somebody say, listen. And my Beyonce voice, listen. <laughs> yeah. So Abraham, he did what God said. God told her, or told him that in your seed, um, in your seed shall be called. For in your, for in Isaac, rather, your seed shall be called. I find this amazing. And this is just a side note um, for y'all Bible scholars. I find it amazing that he said that in your, in your son Isaac, or in Isaac, your seed shall be called. That word called, it actually means also called out to. And I find that amazing because the church, which the Greek word for church that's used in the New Testament, it means ekklesia, which is defined as the called out ones. In other words, what God was saying is that out of Isaac, my church is going to come from. Y'all see that? My church is going to flow through Isaac. It's not going to flow through Ishmael, but it's going to flow through Isaac. But he said, yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed, because he did come from you. He's not the one that I promised, but he did come from you. You know, ultimately what I discovered here and I asked the question, um, well, I made the observation that sometimes it gets hard to bring things to the altar. This was an altar moment for Abraham. He had to make a decision. He had to decide to let go of what mattered to him so that he could embrace what mattered to God. It gets difficult to bring the thing that may not be what God said, but it's, decision, it's the decision that I made. And I've invested so much into it. I've invested my time. I've invested my money. I've invested other resources like my relationships. And I've invested myself into the alternative. It's hard to walk away from the, from the alternative when I have spent so much into this thing. You know how hard it is when you realize that you made a mistake or that you were wrong and you'll go out the way to make it right. You'll try everything you can to make what was wrong a right. But in order to make what was wrong a right, you end up doing more wrong. And I know that this is a different context, but two wrongs don't make a right. I know you can multiply two negatives and it becomes a positive, but you can't keep adding negative to negative to negative and think that you're going to somehow make your way back to the positive. Somebody say it won't work. Yeah, uh, but ultimately the reason why is because when we are when we are presented or when we are offering our lives 
to God as a living sacrifice, that means that we've got to bring God everything. One of the things that I've been sharing or mentioning is that I've got to bring the idea of what I thought or who I thought I was supposed to be. I have to bring the idea of what I thought my marriage was supposed to be. I have to bring the idea of what I thought my business was supposed to be. I have to bring the idea of what I thought church was supposed to be. I have to bring the idea of who I thought my wife was supposed to be. I have to bring all of those things and lay it at the altar. But not just bring it to the altar. I got to be willing to take the knife and bring it down on that thing. But when I go to bring the knife down on it, I say, but Lord, I've been working on that image for so long. I've spent so much time and money trying to make myself look appealing to others. I've been doing all of these things, following every trend, doing all of these challenges on TikTok just to look like a certain group of people. God, I've been doing all of these things in order to make this marriage look like it was working, make it look like it was working, make it look like it's been working. We've been taking taking all of these poses and doing all these things, uh, just snapping it up and everything else, just so that it looked like it was working. God, I've done everything to try to make this look right. I spent so much money. I spent so much time. I bought her a new ring. I bought her a new house. I bought her this. I bought her that. I tried to get my kids to look good, even though I ain't spent no time with them. I tried to do all of these things and make it look right. I I want to look like a good Christian even though I don't pray at all. I've done everything, God, and invested so much. And now you want me to put a knife into this? With Abraham, he didn't hesitate. But for so many of us, this is just in our, this is just a visual illustration. We stand this close to the altar. And we say, <sighs> and we sit there and we keep looking. After a while, we say, no, nah, I can't do it. And we go and sit down. <sighs> and we act like everything all right for a while. But then all of a sudden, you can sense the spirit of God calling you and you stand up on the inside of you and you wait, make your way back to the altar. And you're like, but she was supposed to be like what I had in mind. The business was supposed to blow up after a year. You told me you were going to bless me. So I tried to do something else. And I put too much money into this. I put too much time in this. I ain't getting no younger. I can't go back. I can't get that time back. And we sit there at the altar, struggling. Let's work this out for just a second. Can we do that? Let's talk about, let's talk about uh, the time, right? Right, right. I, I spent so much time into that thing. Brother Dre, I can't get it back. All the time I invested in that thing, I can't get that back. The time that I spent away, I can't get that back, Mother McKinney. How can I? And I've been investing, I put 10 years into this thing. You put 10 years into the business, has it grown any? You put 10 years into the marriage, the way you want it to, has it changed any? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've been working at that place for 10 years. Have you prospered in that place? Ah, oh, come on now. Yeah, yeah. Somebody say, bring it to the altar. Time was the first hurdle. Now, okay, money. Oh, that's the, we talked about the money, right? I put thousands of dollars into this thing. I put thousands of dollars into this into this this measure or this 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 thing that I've been that I've been trying to get back. You know, I, I, I remember as a little boy, young man rather, I was in high school, and Michael, oh, one of the things we used to do is we would sit in the lunchroom, and before school would start, we get our breakfast, you know, get that sausage biscuit. Y'all remember them sausage biscuits? Oh yeah, 
Put that mitts bear jelly on it. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. It was good, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't have McDonald's. We had the school lunch. So I would take it, go and sit with my friends, and guess what we would do? Brother Dre, we would play Tonk. Now, what we may do is if we've been real, you know, real safe, we'll play a quarter a game. Y'all follow me, right? Whoever wins takes the marbles. You get the money. And so we'll play a quarter game. Then after a while, you done lost four quarters. How many dollars is that? So now I want my dollar back, but the time is running out. So it's double or nothing. Next thing you know, I'm out of two dollars. <laughs> Next thing you know, we said, well, let's just play a dollar a game, a dollar a game, a dollar a game. Next thing you know, I'm out of ten dollars. I say, well, double or nothing. The guy, Javante, he was like, like, all right. I put that money up there. Don't y'all know I walked away missing $20? I felt so shamed. I felt so embarrassed because he just walked away with 20 of my dollars. Not just $20. It was my money, Bree. And he walking out. He's smiling, too. All right, man, I'll see you later. The bell done wrong. He gone. Lunchtime. I got to make this money back. You see where I'm going with this? When you've invested something into something, you're going to tr try to do everything you can to get a return out of it. But I want you to realize that no matter how much money you put in that thing, that you can never match what God has for you if you would give him everything. Y'all got to hear me what I'm saying here. He said that if you withhold nothing from him, that he would bless you beyond measure. But because you still focus on a couple of dollars that you spent, that are pennies to him, that it's nothing to him. He said, if you would try me in this, if you would offer your life to me he said that I would pour out the will he will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you don't have room enough to receive meaning that God will bless you immeasurably and beyond beyond measure now here's the problem when we hear a scripture like that we still thinking about money but I've tried to tell you up until this point that it's more than money the money was just to say it was connected to your heart but God wants your whole life if you would give God your whole life God won't have no problem with blessing you if you would give him your whole mind God would have no problem with blessing you if you would give him everything that is in you God would have no problem with blessing you somebody say God I give you everything hallelujah oh God give him a praise right there Glory to your name. Glory, glory, glory. Let's go a little further. I got to get through this. I got to get through this. Let's go a little further, a little further. Now we find, can I get a towel first, lady? Now we got to go a little further. We said that the time, the money, those are my investments, right? But I can't forget about the relationships. Because when you choose to go the way that God didn't tell you to, there are people in your life that are brought along for the ride. With Abraham, it was Hagar. And now a son that's been brought into the world. All because he lost sight of the promise and opted for an alternative. Opted for a substitute. Opted for another way. He kept his options open. And here, it's not, and here's the reason why it's stressing him out. It, it wasn't the money. He got plenty of that. It wasn't the time God has blessed him. Ultimately, the problem was the relationship. Here it is, this woman and this child now have to suffer because of my mistake. One of the worst things to do is be on the other side of your mistake and realize that there were so many people that were affected by your choices. 
Who was affected by your choices? Who was impacted by your stubbornness? Who was impacted by, by your decision making? Who was it? For some parent, it's your child that felt the suffering of your decision. For some business owner, it was employees that felt the weight of your decision making. This is why it's so hard for a business owner to shut down a business. He's got to think about all the employees and the families. Mouths that won't be fed. People who are going to have to start over, find another job. And they followed you because they trusted you. But now here, they're having to experience the effects of choosing the alternative. They have no idea. Your family don't even know that you made these decisions. Your business has no idea. Your, your, your employees have no idea that you made those decisions. Pastors who have made decisions and the flock has to deal with the consequence of it. And they don't even know. But yet, it's hard to let go because I see who's attached to it. But while we can easily look at everybody else on the outside, the ones who suffer the most are the ones who have to live with you. Your wife has to deal with you being up and down. She has to deal with you withdrawing away because you're depressed has to be confused with whether or not you want her. She don't even realize the, the burden of, of stress that you are carrying on your back. And while she feels like, like you are rejecting her, you're really embarrassed. Oh, come on. I can't tell you what I don't know. I can't tell you what I don't know, y'all. This ain't reaching. This is from reaching within. Can I be real in this house today? Here it is. Your family don't realize why you got mood swings. The kids, they say, all I did was ask you a question. What, what I did? I didn't even say nothing. You cuss me out. I do nothing. What I did? Your family has to deal with the debt from a bad decision. Listen, y'all, I had to learn to stay out the pawn shops. I wasn't selling stuff. I was putting stuff on layaway. Because Dre, in my mind, I said, I could use that. Yes, I was a hoarder. Somebody say, the Lord delivered me. Thank you, Jesus. But I said, it's useful. So the money that should have been saved, I go and put it on layaway. But then what's so crazy is money get tight or I don't put too many layaways out there. You follow me? And now I ain't got enough money to go and make each payment. So I end up losing everything. I'm sharing with you my life because hopefully you'll be able to see something out of my life that'll apply to your life. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I invested my investments. But then outside of, we, we talked about the time, the money, the, the relationships, but not me. At the end of it all, I'm depleted, I'm depressed. And I don't know if I'm going to make it. And the only thing that kept me going was that I refused to quit. Y'all okay with me being real with y'all? Struggling into the pulpit. Oh, come on now. Church has no idea what's going on with Enrique Dante Brooks. Struggling to prayer 365. Sometimes I could fake it and smile, but there were some days I looked back and I saw what I looked like. 
I had to look in the mirror, brother. brother. And I began to weep. Because I saw me. I saw somebody who had been trying to fake it and could not fake it any longer. I saw somebody who was empty. I saw somebody who had nothing left to give. But here I am still trying to hold on to the alternative. Because I'm not willing to bring it to the altar. I don't know who they're speaking to today. But I want you to know that you don't have to hold on to the alternative. There's still time for you to opt for the promise. Somebody say, Jesus Jesus. is the promise. Let's go a little further. I got to close this out. There's no way I'm going to get everything that I desire to say out of this. But I'm just going to give you these three points. Let's go to um, Galatians chapter 4. I'm going to read just a piece of this. I may have to sum it up, but I want you to write that down. Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 31. Write that down because I'm going to have to summarize this. I don't have enough time to read through this. What I want you to know, uh, what I want you to know about these two sons, you've got Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael came first, Isaac came second, but Isaac is the promise. Does that make sense? Ishmael represents the works of the flesh. He came by way of the flesh. That was a fleshly effort. Isaac came by way of the work of the spirit. A woman having a baby at 89 or 90 years old, it had to be God. Yeah. There's no other way to explain that. But that was by the works of God. So Ishmael represents the works of the flesh. Isaac represents the works of God or the works of the spirit. Y'all follow me? Okay, now we go a little further in Galatians chapter four. And what Apostle Paul does is now he explains and shares that the two of them represented a greater truth. The two of them represented two covenants. One of them represented the law, which is ultimately being governed by the flesh or has to be fulfilled by the flesh. But we as humans, we don't have the ability to fulfill the requirement of the law. Y'all know what the law is. Uh, you felt the law every time you got you heard the preacher preaching fire and brimstone. Uh, where they told you and, and, gave, and made you seem like you had to make sure that you hit every uh, dot, every I and cross, every T in order to give your life to Jesus. Uh, understand that that right there, while it was good to try to teach us what holiness was, ultimately what it did is it tied our salvation to the works of the flesh. But I want you to know that Jordan, there's nothing that you can do physically that can help you get saved you can't do anything in this body that will help you get saved Jesus had the same question come to him after he had fed the 5,000 he crossed through across the sea they chased him over there and they ran up to him and said Jesus what must I do in order to do the works of God hear what Jesus said in John chapter 6 he said the only work that you must do is believe the one whom God sent but yet we find ourselves wanting to do everything we just want to work 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 baby you are not Rihanna you need to learn that you are a child of God and the only work that you've got to do is believe somebody say believe you got to believe in Jesus that he is the son of God everything flows through your faith but understand remember the two sons represent two covenants Ishmael represented what was done by way of the flesh Isaac represented what was done by way of the spirit it was not because of the goodness of man but it was because of the goodness of God I want you to know that the blessing that God has for you is not because of what you did Michael it's not because of what you did brother Gerald it's not because of what you did since the Shangri-La I know you talented sweetie you got great gifts that God has put inside of you but the success that God has for you has nothing to do with your artistic capability it has everything to do with the grace of God somebody say I thank you for your grace oh God I bless you today God oh God I give you glory 
God, I give you honor, Lord. Oh, I thank you. Let me wrap this up. Let me wrap this up. So Paul is trying to make a distinction. As long as you keep on trying to fulfill the law, understand that you are literally putting yourself under a curse. Because the Bible says that except you keep every word inside of the book of the law, you are cursed. And so no matter how hard I tried, Brother Dre, Rike just couldn't get right. No matter how hard I tried, Chandra, there was nothing that I could do that could make things all right. Dick and Claude no matter what I did I could never get right I couldn't fulfill the law but somebody say I thank God for Jesus you see there's this boy that came up out of Nazareth there's a boy that that came up out of Nazareth who's known as the son of God yes he was the son of Mary yes he was the son of Joseph but that was his step daddy his true daddy was God God the father and the Bible says that he himself became a curse so that we don't have to become a curse it's in your Bible and understand that from that point the Bible says that, that he cursed is any man that hangeth from a tree. Where was he at on Calvary? Where was he at on Golgotha? He was on a tree and he became a curse. The one that did no sin. The one that was blameless so that we might find freedom. Somebody say my promise is tied to freedom. I'm not chasing the law no more. I'm not trying to fulfill every, 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 everything that was in that book because I'm going to mess it up. But as long as I put my faith in Jesus, no longer would I have to chase after a law. He said, I'll write the law on your heart. No longer will I have to pursue to do right. He said, I'll put my spirit inside of you. Come on, Ezekiel chapter 36. And he said, and I'll make you do right. I'll cause you to live right. You won't have to struggle in order to do right you won't have to struggle to live right I will cause you to live right but you can experience this if you choose the alternative the only way that you can experience this inheritance is that you've got to choose the promise I'm gonna have to talk about these in prayer 365 but write them down just to meditate on them write these down three points We'll come back to it in prayer 365 this week. Here it is. Number one, believers are the children of the promise. Hallelujah. Believers are the children of the promise. Paul told them, he said, because we come through Isaac and we are heirs of Jesus because he's the seed that God was talking about back then. By faith, we become heirs of the promise just like Isaac. Uh, sons of the promise, children of the promise. Uh, here's number two. Number, the alternative is a substitute. The alternative is a substitute. But watch this. It will never replace the promise. Write this down. I want you to remember this. Believers are the children of the promise. That was number one. Number two was the alternative is a substitute. You could put a colon there, a semicolon. It will never replace the promise. I don't care how good it looks. I don't care how good it sounds. I don't care what they promised you, Brianna. It'll never replace the promise. You could flip that hair all you want to. It'll never replace the promise. Number three, the promise and the alternative cannot coexist. The promise that God made for you and the alternative choices that you make, they can't coexist. One has to go. Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. Joshua, he told him, he said, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether it be the God of your ancestors or the God of these other countries. 
He said, but as for me and my house. Hallelujah. I don't care what they do over there across town. As for me and my house. I don't care what they do in other churches. As for me and my house. I don't care what they do in other companies. As for me and my house. I don't care what they do in their house and their marriage, baby. For me and our house. We are going to serve who? The Lord. He's saying here, Abraham had to choose. His wife came and she told him just right. She said, you got to get rid of them. Because this promise was never meant for him. I know we messed up. I quoted this the other day. I was laughing, but it's so serious. The songwriter said, I've got to clean up what I've messed up. I have to. Somebody says it's called accountability. Don't think you can make a mess and not have to clean it up. If you need to apologize to somebody, go and apologize to them. If you've got to pay people back, go and pay them back. Because whatever the mess that was made and it was at your hand, you got to take responsibility and clean that mess up. Somebody say clean it up. They cannot coexist. You can't reach for the promise and say, well, God, I'm going to hold on to plan B. You can't reach for what God said and hold on to what you said. You've got to be willing to let it go. Can we stand all over the building and give God a hand clap of praise for the word today? This week, we're going to we're going to reflect on what we talked about there at the end. But right now, I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to, I'm not asking you to come up here. I'm not even asking you to raise your hand. What I want you to do is I want you to think within yourself. And ask yourself a question. Even I would say, ask the Spirit of God this question. That's better. Say, Lord, what do you want me to take away from this message? It's just that simple. What do you want me to take away from this, God? What are you saying to me today? And if you are making a decision to lay a gift at the altar, not this one up here, I told you earlier that, or before rather, that your life is the altar and you are the sacrifice. I want to pray for you, everybody. If you desire, if you so desire, you can lift your hands with me. Father, I thank you for the, for the message today. I thank you for your word, Father. Father, I said what I believe in my heart that you had me to say. But Father, I pray for the one who is, who's been struggling with making their way to the altar. Father, I pray that, Lord, that they've heard something that would encourage them, even urge them to make a decision. Father, I thank you that, that, Lord, you've taught us that we can't have both. That the promise and the alternative cannot coexist. But, Father, while going after the alternative, Father, there are mistakes that we've made. Messes that we've made. Father, I pray for the one that's going to clean up. I pray for their strength, Lord, for the one that's going to clean up. I pray for their hearts, Lord. I pray for courage, Father, as they go through and they clean up, Father. Father, you give them grace, God. In our weakness, your strength is made perfect. Father, go with them as they clean it up, Father. But Father, I believe that somebody today has made the decision 
to give their life fully to you. I believe that somebody today has made the decision to believe in your son, Jesus. Father, I pray that you continue to do the work. Father, even as we leave this place, Father, let your word marinate in the hearts of all of us, God. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, everybody say amen. Amen. Give God a hand clap of praise. Amen.